What is the nature of freedom? This is the topic of George Herbert's uh, short little lyric poem, The Caller. Uh, in this, he articulates freedom not as an absolute, uh, not as uh, the freedom to choose and to do whatever he wills, although he will present that view within the constraints of the poem, but rather considers it as a Christian and with uh, the paradox that Martin Luther in his short treatise, The Freedom on the Freedom of the Christian, uh, published in 1520. Now, this is one of the three uh, writings of Luther that characterize the evangelical theology of the whole Reformation. Uh, the first is uh, to the Christian nobility of the German nation. Uh, the second is the, Bap uh, the Babylonian captivity of the church. And the third is on the freedom of the Christian. Now, the paradox, which is going to be uh, demonstrated by Herbert in his poem in relation to his vocation as a priest, remember the poem's called The Caller, has two uh, seemly, seemingly contradictory propositions. One, a Christian is an utterly free man, Lord of all, subject to none. And on the other hand, a Christian is an utterly dutiful man, servant of all, subject to all. These two propositions are the uh, central paradox of this poem, once again called The Caller. The Caller, uh, just uh, for sake of uh, understanding here is a reference to the dog collar. Now the dog collar is the little, now I'm wearing something here like uh, what an, a clergyman could wear. And if I had the little white strip here that uh, observes that's in Anglican uh, parlance, this is called a dog collar. And obviously it's something uh, that expresses constraint and obviously slightly pejorative and, and humorous as well as is the English won't. But in Herbert's poem, it does ref re reflect that constraint, but it also expresses this paradox, the paradox which is at the center of Luther's articulation of the freedom of a Christian. Now, I am going to submit that it has something to say to us when we are even talking about the nature of freedom in our day. And the Christian understanding that freedom is actually liberty under the law liberty under the law of God. Now, at, at present in Canada, as I speak, we are uh, under the conditions of a uh, Emergencies Act, um, which will suspend civil liberties if it goes through. And uh, one of the issues here is the nature of freedom, uh, whether too much freedom, excessive freedom, impinges on others' freedoms and thereby uh, becomes uh, license or uh, immorality. And this is one of the issues that arises out of this. And of course, it is the case that if I exercise my liberty to its utmost, I may actually restrict someone else's liberty, in which case I have sinned against them, in which case uh, my maximal freedom may affect others' ability to maximize their freedom, in which case uh, restraint results. Uh, Jesus, as ever, in Luther's mind and in uh, Herbert's for that matter as well, has is the paradigm of freedom and obedience. And uh, it's being articulated here in the poem. Let me look briefly at the poem and I'll, uh, we'll exegete it a little bit and then we'll say some more on that topic. But I, I, let me just say one final thing. It just struck me. There's very much uh, discussion these days uh, ever since Hegel of the master-slave dialectic. It's a part of postmodern literary theory to very much talk about this, the nature of mastery and, and servanthood. And all of it is seen in terms of power and not in terms of, of uh, yes, freedom, but not in terms of morality. And this goes back all the way to Aristotle. Aristotle says, if there is a Lord, then there is also a servant. And if there is a servant, then there's also a Lord. But under the apostle Paul's teaching, which echoes, um, is echoed by Luther, I believe, uh, following uh, both uh, Paul and Jesus, he connects the Lord and the servant in, the, in one person. And that there's the paradox right there. The Lord Jesus Christ 
is a servant of all. He washes his disciples' feet. He uh, bears our sins, uh, bearing his cross, bearing our sins, uh, serves us in ways that we could not serve ourselves. And he does so out of his own free will. No one commands him to do it. No one forces him to do it. He takes it upon himself with all freedom. So this is an expression of the Reformation in, its, uh, in terms of duty, in terms of freedom, and the, the sense that duty is freedom, rightly understood. So by faith alone, God sets a man, this is going to be Luther's understanding, it's going to be Herbert's understanding, he sets a man utterly, completely free in Christ. So he's Lord of all. He's subject to no one. But love binds him as an utterly dutiful servant to his neighbor, which makes him subject to everyone. And this plays out in this paradox of faith and love. And so now let's look at the caller. I struck the board and cried, no more, I will abroad. What? Shall I ever sigh and pine? My lines are li and life are free, free as the road, loose as the wind, as large as store. Shall I be still in suit? Have I no harvest but a thorn to let me blood and not restore what I have lost with cordial fruit? Sure, there was wine before my sighs did dry it. There was corn before my tears did drown it. Is the year only lost to me? Have I no bays to crown it? No flowers, no garlands gay, all blasted, all wasted? Not so, my heart. But there is fruit, and thou hast hands. Recover all thy sigh-blown age on double pleasures. Leave thy cold dispute of what is fit and not. Forsake thy cage, thy rope of sands, which petty thoughts have made and made to thee good cable to enforce and draw and be thy law while thou didst wink and wouldst not see. Away, take heed, I will abroad, call in thy death's head there, tie up thy fears. He that forbears to suit and serve his need deserves his load. But as I raved and grew more fierce and wild at every word, methought I heard one calling, child and i replied my lord <clears throat> so this poem as you can see is a, a sort of monologue with himself uh, there's a voluble self here if you will a, a voice of protest uh, arising within the poet uh, objecting to the terms of his vocation of his calling of his duty as a priest and he feels it around his neck like a collar and obviously uh, we have in mind as I said the sense of the dog collar that the priest wears but also the more standard and obvious sense of a collar is something that constrains him is choking him is limiting and is to be seen only in terms of a limitation on his freedom and so the part of him that longs to be free from that repeatedly uh, protests and demands that very thing, liberty and enjoyment and life and, and fruit and a freedom from affliction and a freedom from duty and a freedom from constraint and an ability to uh, live for himself and for himself alone. All these things are expressed in the caller and expressed repeatedly back and forth. And he gets more and more, as it says towards the end, he raved and grew more fierce and wild at every word. Whose word? His own word. His own words, in fact, are the ones that are driving him insane, this voluble self, the part of himself that rails against his vocation and misunderstands his freedom as a restriction of his liberty, losing the sense of, again, the conjuncture of freedom and duty that is the paradox of Christian liberty as Luther expressed it and Herbert understood it. But as he does so, he hears as well as speaks. And that's only towards the conclusion of the poem. He hears one calling child. And I replied, my Lord. Now the resolution of the poem is thus um, somewhat sudden and it comes 
quite contrary to the general trajectory of the poem, which is to get more and more desperate and feel more and more choked by duty and particularly his vocation as a servant of others in the service of Christ as a minister. Think of these words by Paul, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all. Uh, likewise, Romans uh, 13, verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. Love, by its very nature, is ready to serve and to be subject to the one who is loved. And so Christ, though he was Lord of all, Galatians 4, verse 4, was uh, that is born of a woman born under the law and therefore is at the same time was at the same time a free man and a servant in the form of god and of a servant so if you look at philippians 2 verses 6 and 7 so he is free christ in and of himself but he chose to bind himself under the law to serve his creatures and to win their salvation so his salvific example becomes a, a form of Christian freedom, which is unknown to the ancient world. Aristotle can't understand it. Our libertarian brethren in our day can't understand it. They think freedom is the capacity to do whatever you choose. That is not the Christian understanding of freedom. Freedom involves a duty. It is constraint, as again, our charter states, uh, acknowledging the supremacy of God and the rule of law in our country. So that is a form of constraint upon our freedom right there, articulated. Now, freedom has different facets, we could say. One relates to the inner man, if you will, to use Luther's parlance. The other refers to the outer. Now, the inner man uh, becomes righteous and free and and pious in Christ, and the word of God does it all. So uh, Milton echoes this uh, in the conclusion of Paradise Lost, when Adam is thrown out of the Garden of Eden, he receives the consolation after Adam professes uh, faith in his Redeemer, who is yet to come, obviously, but he professes faith in the one that he has, that his uh, he has been told will will one day redeem him his seed he's told these words he says that if you add faith and works um you will have a paradise within you happier far so this is the inner man who is freed from all constraint and there are no limitations upon that but externally how does it apply outwardly are we to be content by living by faith alone and not do any works is, is the liberty that Luther articulates a liberty of ease, of sitting back. We're freed from any obligations. Um, Luther replies in this way. He says, uh, not so, you who charge so, you wicked men who would rebuke me for this understanding of the, the true nature of faith being a, a freedom of the inner man, not so. That would be indeed proper if we were wholly in inner, wholly inner and perfectly spiritual men, but such as we shall be only at the last day, the day of the resurrection of the dead. And uh, But as long as we live in the flesh, we only begin to make some progress in that we shall be perfected in the future life. And so we need, must needs do good works. As a consequence of the inner freedom, we will act as servants of others because we understand our nature of freedom entirely connected to Jesus Christ. He has won us our freedom. We are in Christ, to use Paul's parlance here again. And so in the caller, he uh, rails on and on about the uh, sense of constraint upon himself. Once again, I'll share the screen here of the caller. And he's outwardly railing. He's comparing himself to others. He's comparing the things that he, he cannot do because of what he's, um, because of the collar he wears around his neck. He sees the path that leads 
to go down any path he chooses. He sees them right before him. Shall I ever sigh and pine? My lines in life are free. Free as the road, loose as the wind, as large as store. Shall I be still in suit? Do I have to stay in my uh, clerical vestments? Is there nothing for me but affliction in life? Is there not? There's there no joy? He's sensing the limitations of this because once again he's looking uh, to himself and he's looking to others, but he's not looking to Christ. And note that, that this is an important feature of this poem, The Caller, is that at the, in the beginning he is looking at himself and he's feeling sorry for himself. He might be looking at others and seeing their uh, flourishing in life as wealthy individuals, freed from cares and concerns being selfish in their actions. And he, he is envious of why the wealthy prosper and the righteous, such as he is, are afflicted. And this continues. And he, he raves himself up into a froth until he finally stops speaking and he hears. And note, just as his salvation began when Christ saved him, so here he is called back to his sense of freedom from constraint and his liberty and his vocation by a voice that comes from the outside. I heard one calling child and I replied, my Lord. So I think I'll conclude with that here, but note how important these considerations are, um, even more so when we come to Mr. Milton and his understanding of liberty in area pagetica, uh, but also as the consolation of paradise lost. Uh, there is an inner freedom uh, nonetheless, that is constrained by God's righteousness. So it's not freedom to do whatever we want. That's not Christian freedom. It's not even real freedom. It could not, my freedom would only come at the expense of enslaving others. And that would not be human freedom. The only hu true human freedom is that of the Christian. And that is what Herbert articulates here.